So uh, let me start. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our uh, honored guest. Uh, and it's Lina Voita. And uh, she's uh, currently a PhD researcher at the University of Edinburgh and uh, at, at the simultaneously at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, her advisors are Professor Ivan Kitkov and Enrico Sandrich. And he's also, uh, she's also supported by Facebook uh, PhD fellowship. And she's uh, uh, mostly working on NLP problems like neural uh, uh, machine translation, which is going to be her uh, uh, title of the talk. And uh, she spent four years at uh, Yandex and as a research scientist, and also she taught uh, many courses on uh, NLP at the uh, Yandex School of Data Analysis. By the way, wh where is uh, uh, Yandex located? Uh, what, where's the headquarters? Uh, in Moscow, in Moscow. Yeah. Uh, in Moscow, I well, it has It is other, other headquarters, but uh, the main one is in Moscow, yeah. Okay, great. So without... Uh, no further ado, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Lina Voita. So, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here. It's uh, the first time I'm, I'm in Seoul, uh, even online, and that's really nice. And so today I'm going to talk about, uh, well, lots of our work with the uh, event of Jika uh, which can briefly be summarized as neural machine translation inside out. As you probably know, in the last decade, um, machine translation came all the way from traditional statistical approaches to end-to-end -end neural ones. And this transition was rather remarkable. It changed uh, the way we think about the machine translation task, its component, uh, components, and uh, even what it means to translate. Uh, traditional statistical uh, machine translation uh, splits translation task into different components corresponding to the competences researchers think the models should have. Uh, usually, uh, the translation task is split into uh, a target site language model, which helps, um, which is responsible for target site fluency, for generating fluent sentences in the target language, and a translation model, which is responsible for the translation itself. The translation model is in turn split into lexical translation probabilities and word alignment probabilities. And usually there are also lots of handcraft features. Um, note that all these components and features are gathered and trained separately and then combined together in a model. In neural MT, uh, everything is end to end. So here we have a single neural network um, that just reads lots of parallel data and somehow gets to know, uh, gets to learn the translation task directly without splitting it into subtasks. Let me give you an intuitive illustration of the differences between these two mindsets. In the two approaches, we have humans and a model. In traditional approaches in SMT, humans tell the model, uh, hey model, take this, this, that, and this other stuff. This is how you solve the task, right? And the model, uh, the model says, okay, because, well, um, what else can it do? In NMT, um, the model um, is trained, uh, it works great, and it tells us, hey, uh, look how good I am. Reading lots of stuff made me understand things. And um, here we are, confused, surprised, and asking how. The question of how is the main question of this talk, and I will try to answer it, keeping in mind how things used to be done in traditional statistical approaches. From that perspective, there can be different questions. Uh, for example, can NMT model components take the roles mirroring SMT components or features? How does NMT balance being fluent and adequate? Because in traditional approaches, uh, target site fluency and adequacy were modeled via distinct components, dis distinct models. Uh, but in NMT, um, a neural network somehow gets to learn this tool at the same time. And finally, how does NMT acquire different competences during training? And how does it mirror the different models in traditional SMT? 
And again, uh, what important here is that um, in SMT, different competencies were modeled via distinct models and then combined together. In NMT, um, everything can exist together and somehow NMT model gets to learn everything at the same time during training. Okay, so um, here is what we'll try to answer and uh, let's start with the uh, model components and their roles. And this part uh, will be very high level because it will be based on um, earlier works and the rest will be in more detail. Uh, so um, the first question is, how, can NMT model components take the roles mirroring SMT components or features? Well, of course they can, everybody knows that, right? Um, decoding code attention is closely related to word alignments. Uh, but uh, fortunately I have something more interesting for you. Let us look um, not at the standard uh, MT model and standard attention, but at a context-aware model. So what is context-aware MT? Standard machine translation processes source sentence and uh, generates target sentence. For example, uh, here we have uh, a sentence, it was hungry, and the model generates um, uh, the Russian uh, sentence, uh, which roughly means uh, he was hungry. Because in Russian, uh, the, the nouns are gendered. So when we're translating uh, it was hungry, we have to translate it into some gendered noun. Um, but um, this is usually what happens. But uh, sometimes um, the source sentence does not contain enough information to translate it. For example, here we have uh, an ambiguous pronoun it, which can have uh, several potential or several correct translations into Russian. For example, uh, masculine, feminine, neuter, or plural pronoun. And uh, note that this is not uh, only specific to Russian, but for any language with the gendered nouns. So what do we do? We don't have enough information to translate the sentence. So what we do is we take um, one previous sentence and plug it in. Specifically, uh, we take the standard transformer model. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, right? So we take the standard transformer model and in the final encoder layer, we um, have additional attention to context. So this is, um, this, um, in this way, we make interaction with context limited to be able to analyze it. So we go to some promise and quality, but let us uh, note what we're interested in. Uh, we are interested um, in the model components, right? And their roles. So let us look here at this um, attention layer um, to context. Uh, here's uh, an attention map. On their x-axis uh, is the context sentence, the previous sentence, right? Uh, there was a time I would have lost my heart to a face like yours. And on the y-axis is uh, the source sentence and the one we need to translate. And you no doubt would have broken it. Uh, so if we look at the ambiguous pronoun it in the source sentence and look uh, at the attention weights, we'll see that most of the attention mass comes to their noun heart, the antecedent, um, it, it's the antecedent of the pronoun it, right? It's the noun uh, it refers to. So it refers to the heart and the model learned to um, resolve anaphora. In the paper, we show that this is a general pattern. So this is not just one example, this is a general pattern. The model indeed uh, learned to resolve an opera. And what is interesting here? So while traditional approaches uh, engineered special paper speeches to handle various phenomena, so uh, there were humans uh, engineering features and deciding uh, which features the model need, needs to have, right? In NMT, uh, model components uh, can learn to take specific roles, for example, extracting features. And sometimes, like in this case, these features correspond to the ones modeled explicitly in SMT, for example, an offer resolution. Uh, Lina, uh, what are the yeah. examples of uh, model components here? Uh, attention layer from source to context, this one. Oh. This is attention from source to context. Okay, so it's like an uh, attention uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, location or uh, relationship. Yeah, of... yeah. So it's a mechanism which allows to focus on different parts of a sentence. So here, each token 
um, can take some information from context. And here, uh, let's have a look at how it takes this, uh, from which tokens it takes information. So we see that uh, the pronoun it takes information from the noun heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is learned end to end. So um, their only supervision objective is the standard machine translation objective. So it, the model learned to do this because it was uh, useful for the translation task. Okay. Okay, and but uh, this was relatively easy because uh, here we designed uh, the model in a way that we knew where to look, right? We made an interaction with context limited to be able to analyze it. Uh, but what about the standard models, the standard machine translation? Um, for example, there are the currently standard model is the transformer, uh, and it has a lot of layers and uh, uh, a lot of our model components in each layer. For example, uh, the standard model has um, six encoder layers and in each layer we have eight attention heads. So it's 48 attention heads uh, only for one encoder. So um, as we see, there's a lot of model components, uh, but uh, how can we understand which components are more important? because um, we have to know where to look, right? We cannot look at all 48 heads. Uh, in the paper, we use uh, one of the attribution methods to try to identify uh, attention heads or model components contributing to prediction more. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can look at the paper or the blog post or at my personal page. Uh, but um, important here is what we find. And what we find is that only a few attention heads are important, so we have a lot of layers and a lot of attention heads in each layer, but um, in the end, after the model is trained, only a few of them are really important. And only a few are, um, of them contribute to generating translations. And if we look at this uh, important uh, components, um, we see that they play interpretable roles. For example, uh, attention to adjacent tokens around these oppositional heads. For example, here you see that um, all tokens point to the previous token. Right, so they put all the attention mass to the previous token. For uh, syntactic heads, uh, we note that um, some of these important attention heads uh, learned to track uh, syntactic relations, for example, uh, subject verb agreement or verb object agreement, or attention to rare tokens. So, um, in the end, uh, um, what do we see here? So again, in traditional SMT, uh, humans used to tell model um, what, is, what is good for this model, right? And humans used to give the model the features um, it needs, right? Uh, but in NMT, um, so it is still hard to fully understand how uh, neural networks work. At least as a consolation prize, we get to see that uh, some of the model components learned to take um, roles of extracting some features which previously were put into uh, machine translation models explicitly. So here uh, in SMT, humans give features to model. In NMT, um, the neural network learns somehow learns to extract features which are useful and um, we can use these features for some other tasks. And not only this is fun, but uh, it is also useful. For example, if we know that only a few model components are important, we can build simple models. Uh, for example, where some of the components are fixed. For example, if we know that uh, some of the attention heads um, take positional roles uh, attendant to previous or next token, um, in a low resource setting, we can fix uh, these components to take these roles and train on the rest. And in, in low resource settings, uh, we can get uh, lots of improvement from that and some other modifications. And uh, also, if, if you know that important components play interpretable roles, uh, we can be, uh, build uh, better models via regularization or supervision of entire model components. For example, if you know that uh, some model components track syntactic relations, uh, we can uh, add additional supervision for these components to uh, enforce this behavior further, right? And uh, by this, you can also uh, get uh, some improvements. Okay, uh, so um, now we come to 
something more global. So, so far we focused on rather small things, uh, namely features, right? And we saw that model components can take roles of extracting some features. Uh, but now let's come to something more global, uh, namely adequacy and fluency. And um, uh, here I will focus on our ACL 2021 paper. So uh, here we focus on um, the two basic uh, machine translation characteristics. It's fluency, uh, which is uh, agreement on the target side, right? Because uh, a machine translation model has to generate fluent sentences in the target language. Uh, and adequacy, which is responsible for the connection to the source. It means that not only the sentence we generate has to be a fluent sentence in the target language, it also has to have to be uh, a translation of the source, right? Uh, and, yeah. does, does the fluency kind of uh, relate to the kind of uh, the, uh, well, what do you call that, the naturalness uh, in terms of like uh, in, in the viewpoint of a uh, uh, native tongue or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's related to, uh, very well to naturalness, but um, how natural the translation is, um, is something we care about if uh, the model is already very good. Mm -hmm. For example, nowadays uh, machine translation models are very good and naturalness is what we care about, right? Uh, is it natural from the human uh, perspective? But uh, early in the days, it just meant to be um, coherent uh, and all the syntactic relations, uh, all the um, uh, cases have to agree with each other in the sentence. It has to be like, a valid sentence in the target language, at least. How do you right? guarantee, if, if, how do you guarantee fluency? Uh, like just, just from the data set or are there some- Yes, uh, usually, um, well, uh, in traditional approaches, um, these two uh, characteristics we modeled by different components. So there uh, for fluency, we had a target site language model, right? So we had a target style language model, which was responsible for this fluency. And adequacy was modeled with a translation model, which consisted of a lexical translation and uh, reordering. And, and um, in the end, these two models were combined together. So uh, there was a score from a language model uh, responsible for fluency, and there was a score for machine math for translation itself, right? And they were combined to get, um, when generating a final token or getting a score for the final token. So in this equation, uh, X is uh, like source language. So the source, y. yeah, the, the source sentence Y is in the target language. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this was in traditional approaches, but uh, in NMT, you're right. So basically, uh, a neural network just reads lots of parallel data and uh, tries to understand what to do with this data. So in NMT. Um, usually we don't have, uh, we do not enforce uh, fluency specifically, uh, and the model just um, gets to be fluent and actually more fluent than uh, SMT, just by reading the parallel data. So yeah, uh, and, and again, here's the difference between two mindsets because um, in traditional approaches, uh, these two were modeled separately. In NMT, these two functions, fluency and adequacy, being fluent uh, and being adequate, can exist in the same model. And uh, let me put it a bit differently. So uh, usually uh, in NMT, we have an encoder and a decoder. And um, we have um, at each step, so we're generating tokens one by one, and at each step we have um, a prediction. For example, uh, we have a probability of uh, each token being next. And uh, this prediction is based on two very different types of context. Uh, it's a prefix of the target sentence, right, because we're generating uh, tokens one by one, and the source sentence. So the prediction, each prediction is based on two different types of context, uh, but it's not clear uh, what influences the prediction, so the source or the target. And uh, this is what we'll try to understand. And before we come further, uh, let, me, um, let me talk a, a bit about why uh, this is important. Uh, well, in the first place, uh, there's a lot of evidence that um, current uh, NMT models often fail to effectively use these two different types of context, the source and the target. Uh, 
And this can be seen, for example, by modeling modifications, because uh, sometimes um, context gates, which we uh, contributions of source and targets uh, were shown to help for both uh, recurrent models and for transformer model. And uh, another example uh, is hallucinations. It's when uh, a machine translation model generates fluent sentences unrelated to the source. And this is a very interesting case uh, because, well, you, you train a translation model, you want it to translate your sentence, right? And it just generates random stuff in the target language. And this is um, a known uh, problem of uh, machine on neural machine translation. Uh, and um, so how can we detect this? Uh, there's no uh, good method to detect this, only a couple of heuristics and um, uh, uh, among these heuristics, for example, um, ways of looking at decoder and code attention, for example, we can, uh, if you look at decoder and code attention, sometimes uh, we can see that uh, when a model was hallucinating, most of attention is concentrated on, on the, the source end of sentence token, for example, like, like here, or in the other paper, the authors noticed that uh, when hallucinating, the model sometimes puts um, most of its attention to uninformative source tokens, for example, uh, punctuation marks, like here. Uh, but um, the problem is that uh, all this evidence is rather anecdotal. So uh, even for the same transformer model, which is the standard uh, in NMT now, um, we can see different patterns for the same model, right? And not for all hallucination cases, uh, we, we actually can see this deficient attention matrix. But overall, um, we know that sometimes models can ignore the source, and if we had um, if we had a method which can evaluate, estimate how a model uses the source or the target, it could be useful to, uh, for example, evaluate techniques which force a model to rely more on input. Uh, this can be different kinds of regulation, additional loss terms, etc., and uh, to evaluate models for other tasks where reliance on source is important. For example data to text generation, image captioning, etc. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one, now, uh, yeah. I have one quick question uh, for just beginners. Uh, uh, what do you mean by uh, hallucin hallucination, hallucinating in the previous? Hallucination, it's when uh, a model generates fluent sentences in the target language, which are unrelated to the source. So this uh, uh, sometimes uh, NMT models generates uh, fluent sentences in the target language, which are good sentences in the target language, but they are not actually translations of the source. Uh, so the okay. model just ignores the source sentence altogether uh, <laughs> and um, just uh, generates, uh, I don't know, for example, in the source sentence, you have, uh, I saw a cat, and in the translation, you can have something about uh, long blue waves and uh, something like this. This can happen actually. Yes. So with neural models, uh, this is a problem. Does that occur quite frequently in general NMT? Um, it's it depends on where you look. Uh, for example, uh, if you are in uh, out of domain setting, well, this problem is more severe, obviously, because the source is uh, unreliable. The model and uh, does not know what to do with the source, right? And it's just, can just ignore it and say, oh, I, I don't know what to do with it. I just say something, what I know. Um, or, um, uh, yeah, so for out of the source, uh, this can be a problem. Um, do we know in, the, the root cause of that problem? And do we know how to like uh, solve it? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about <laughs> in the rest in the rest of the talk. But uh, generally, um, not really, not really. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, well, usually, um, for example, in academia, if you're just training the model, for example, on news translation task, and you're evaluating on your in-domain data on news translation, and you only care about the blue score, which is automatic evaluation metric, uh, you won't see probably any difference from the model which hallucinates more or less because uh, it's uh, quite rarely. But uh, when we are in a production setting, for example, at Yandex Translate, at Google Translate, mm -hmm. um, we care about user trust, right? We, we, don't, we, are not, we do not only care about uh, automatic evaluation metric, right? We care about users. And um, uh, there, the most important thing is to not lose user trust. 
because if user like uh, types something about I saw a cat and he sees that the translation is not what it meant to be at all, right? Uh, we can lose this user like forever. And uh, for production services, for any for any service with, uh, which deals with humans, uh, with actual humans, is really important. Okay, great. Yeah. And also, there are lots of other applications where this can be a problem. For example, medical domain, news domain, again, right? We don't want to, you know, translate. Um, uh, for example, one, one fun example from uh, the Yandex Translate, I, I hope they won't be offended. Uh, you notice that. Um, so when translating from some uh, from basically any of the languages into Russian, uh, the token president was translated into Putin. <laughs> this is this is not really what we want, but this is like minor example. But when the whole sentence is translated uh, incorrectly, this is not uh, not nice, okay. right? <laughs> or for example, when uh, we translate from Russian to English and Putin is translated into Obama or something or Trump, uh, this again this is not what you want to happen right okay okay so uh now i hope you're motivated enough uh and um again uh we want to understand what influences the predictions uh, source or target and uh we want not an exact quantity because otherwise we could use uh some uh, attribution method one of the main attribution methods uh, but relative contributions uh, it means uh, that uh, among all the things which contribute to prediction, among all the tokens which contribute to prediction, which part belongs to the source or to the target, right? And for this, we use uh, one of the attribution methods and develop for computer vision. Uh, I hope you all saw this uh, funny cats, funny images with cats and uh, this heat maps. Uh, so um, we use one of such methods, uh, which tries to understand uh, which input parts contributed to a prediction. And uh, layer of propag propagation is one of such methods. So what, uh, how it works. I'm not going to go into detail uh, about the method for this, you can see the paper, but intuitively what happens is that um, while prediction of a classifier or a model is formed from input to output in a forward parse as shown here, um, uh, layer of resonance propagation propagates the prediction recursively from output to input to find parts of um, input important for a prediction. And this method was originally developed for computer vision, so to adapt it for uh, a machine translation model, specifically for transformer, uh, we had to um, we had to come up with some uh, tricks. And for this, uh, you can also see the paper, but intuitively, uh, this is what we do. So we have a prediction. Uh, we propagate this prediction recursively from output to input. And uh, we end up with the token contributions. And um, because of the um, method we use, so we, we chose LRP because um, when we propagate the prediction through a network, the total contribution stays uh, constant. So uh, we start, we're starting from, uh, let's say probability of the highest score and token, right? And we end up with the token contributions uh, and the total contributions of all tokens is equal to the prediction we propagate. Is this and, kind uh, of related to the Gretken kind of uh, techniques? In um, it's, uh, yeah, so Gretken is one of the attribution methods. Yes, there are a lot of, uh, again, there are a lot of attribution methods in computer vision. It can, can be gradient based, for example, a gradient, a gradient times input, grade cam, integrated gradients, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and they are all um, slightly different from each other in some aspects. And uh, uh, this specific method, we chose it because of this conservation principle, because uh, we want relative token contributions, and therefore we need the total contribution of all tokens to, to stay constant, right? So, um, because right now, so we have uh, we had a prediction, we propagated back, we end up with token contributions. The total contribution of all tokens uh, equals the that prediction we propagate, and without loss of generality, we can um, uh, we can say that the total contribution of all tokens equals to one because we can just divide by this uh, prediction we propagate, right? And this is how uh, we end up with the relative contributions of source and target tokens. And generally to 
find input parts which contributed to your prediction. Yes, you can use other attribution methods, but uh, they won't allow you to get this relative contributions. So, and for relative contributions, we use uh, this specific method, uh, which is called layer-wise relative propagation, and is based on this uh, conservation principle. Okay, so what do we expect? Um, when generating, uh, um, we are going to look at uh, the contributions of uh, the source and the target. And for the first target token, uh, obviously, the total contribution of source equals to one because there is no prefix yet. Uh, but as we continue generation, this trade-off between the source and the target can shift either way, right? For example, we can hypothesize that uh, for um, informative tokens, for example, cat and so, uh, the source contribution is higher, but for an informative token such as determiner, um, target contribution can be higher for example, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, how these contributions change during generation. Uh, and specifically, we look at each target position separately because uh, we want to avoid influence of target position, right? And um, uh, we look at the total contribution, the total contribution of source, which is the sum of contributions of all tokens. Uh, or um, so this tells us how the model relies on the source, right? To what extent it's then the prediction is based on the source. And also we look at the entropy of contributions, um, which uh, tells us how focused the contributions are, right? For example, uh, to generate um, some target token, a model can focus on, on a single token in, in the source sentence, or alternatively, it can spread its attention over well, uh, here by, by attention, I don't mean uh, an attention component, by, but um, spread its influence over a broad range of tokens, right? To understand uh, the sentence better. Uh, in and terms uh, of, it, yeah. it, it is uh, higher the better or the lower the better in terms of? Uh, well, there's no better for now because we don't know what the um, ideal performance would be, right? For example, for some tokens, for example, when we generate the cat, uh, probably it's reasonable to focus on the cat token in the source sentence, right? Uh, but when we are generating a determiner or a punctuation mark, maybe it's better to, you know, read the, the whole source. And that's what, what we'll see a bit later. Makes sense, yes. Okay. And uh, also note that we evaluate this on average over a data set and not for a single prediction because uh, we want to, uh, to be able to uh, say something about uh, model behavior in general. We want to be able to say something like, oh, on average, uh, NMT models behave like this or that, right? Therefore, we evaluate this on average over a data set and not for every single prediction. Okay, uh, and uh, in more detail, so uh, we, have, um, we have a data set uh, where the sentences are of the same length to be able to normalize um, over data set, right? Uh, for each target position, we evaluate, um, for example, the total contribution of source for each step, and then we um, average over all evaluation set. And this is uh, how we end up with the, with the general pattern. Okay, so uh, what, uh, what we're gonna do now, is we're gonna look at uh, the behavior of the standard model, the baseline model. And um, after that, we'll come to uh, different models. We'll, we'll come to comparing a different training objectives or uh, different training steps uh, or different prefixes. And that part will be more interesting uh, when we'll compare uh, different models. But for now, let's just understand what's, what's going on um, inside a single model, right? So first, uh, we look at the um, contributions of uh, the source uh, tokens, the total contribution of the source sentence. Uh, on the x-axis is the um, um, target token position. So generation progresses from left to right. And <clears throat> here we start from position two because for the first token, source contribution is always one and uh, it doesn't really <laughs> make much sense to put it on the plot. So what we see is that, uh, so yeah, generation progresses from left to right. And you see as generation progresses, uh, source influence slightly decreases. And this is expected, right? Because 
um, the further away you are from the beginning of the sentence, uh, the less ambiguity it remains, uh, there remains in which source tokens are important, right? Because when you already generated something, you understand what's going on, right? And um, there are fewer source tokens to use. And um, also, on the other hand, um, the further away you are from the beginning, the more effort is needed to, um, to be fluent in the target language, right? So what we see here is that the source influence slightly decreases, which means the target influence increases. And this is expected uh, because of the um, nature of the task and of how we generate the tokens. And what is also interesting is that for the final end of sentence token and for the punctuation mark, uh, the source is used much less than for any of the other tokens. Uh, even here, we, see, we can uh, see that the total contribution um, of source here is less than half, right? It means that for the end of song, uh, sentence token, the target is used more than the source. And again, this is uh, interesting because um, it means that the decision to complete generation, the decision to say, okay, uh, this sentence has to stop now, uh, is made uh, based more on the target side and then on the source. Is this generally true for any language pair instead of just Russian and English pair? Uh, it's uh, Russian English, English German, English French, uh, which are the most uh, popular um, translation directions for, for example, for WMG shared tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assume this, this would be the case for uh, any left to right um, model, because when we generate an, an translation from left to right, right, uh, the decision to complete generation is probably have to be based on um, on the target side and on the source, right? And the, 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 for the punctuation, again, the influence is less, but it's still more based on the source, but for the end of sentence, it's um, more based on the target. Uh, next, let's look at the entropy of contributions. And uh, here we see that, um, well, first, uh, when um, generation progresses, the model relies on broader context um, uh, and the entropy increases. And this is probably expected, right? Because um, there's, there's less ambiguity of which source token to choose for the beginning of sentence, right? Uh, it's usually the, the beginning of sentence, but then you have uh, several potential um, ways to phrase the sentence, right? And here's uh, when um, the model starts to spread its influence across more source tokens. And uh, when we have analyzing translation for the last part, it becomes more focused, which is again, uh, kind of expected because there's less ambiguity. And uh, when most of the translation has already been generated, you already know uh, which source tokens to use and you focus on that. And again, there's a high entropy for punctuation in the end of sentence. And because uh, the decision to finalize a translation requires broader reasoning over the source sentence. Okay, and uh, now, uh, so, so far uh, we looked at um, prefixes of, uh, uh, of reference translations, and this is the same setting as during model training. So the model is trained to predict next token uh, based on, on their prefix and the source. And during training, this prefix comes from reference translation, right? Um, but uh, how about model-generated translations? So what will happen with contributions if we condition on model-generated translations? And uh, um, before, we, before I show you the results, let us think uh, how model-generated translations are different from the references. And we know that compared to references, BIM search translations can contain fewer rare tokens, they have less reorderings, and they are simpler syntactically. So overall, these translations are simpler than references. And uh, for these simpler prefixes, we see that um, the source is used more. So the green line here is uh, the new graph for the model generated uh, translations. And we see that the source is used more. And if we look at the entropy, we see that source contributions are more confident. So when a model is given a simpler prefix, more monotonic prefix, more monotonic translation, right? It's easier to, um, well, there's uh, less effort is needed to stay fluent, 
right, uh, to account for fluency because the translation is simpler. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, less reasoning is required over the source sentence because if you're more monotonic, uh, you're more confident in which tokens, which source tokens to choose. And this is what we see here. Okay, and uh, now let's uh, look at something more interesting. Now we'll look at uh, random sentences as prefixes. And before you before you think that I, I are, <laughs> we are a bit crazy, no, we are not crazy. We have reasons for doing that, and I'm going to explain that. So. Um, in this setting, uh, we have uh, the source sentence. For example, uh, this is this is Russian sentence, and it means I saw a hungry cat when I met yesterday. And the prefix of a random sentence, for example, something like um, something which means the man in a blue shirt. So we have a source sentence, uh, which is a valid sentence, right? We have uh, a valid prefix, uh, which are good separately, but they do not make sense together. And why I will look at the setting? Why are uh, we interested in model behavior in the setting? Uh, well, uh, among other things, we want to understand <clears throat> what happens when a model is hallucinating. And as you remember, hallucinating uh, is producing uh, fluent sentences in the target language unrelated to the source. And random prefixes is the simplest way to simulate this hallucination mode. So if we are given a model random prefixes, which are fluent but unrelated to the source, and we're asking, okay, what, what is now uh, happening with the contributions? Okay, uh, so um, what can we expect? So we have uh, a model which is based, uh, which predictions is based uh, on two types of context, source and the prefix. And um, list and now in the second list of parts do not make sense together. So the, the model has to ignore one of these parts to make uh, to make a prediction. And from previous work, we know that in principle, um, a model can ignore the source. This is when a model is hallucinating, right? We, we know that a model can hallucinate and it can ignore the source. And on the other hand, uh, there was a work showing that uh, language models have uh, a self-recovery ability, which means that uh, when given gibberish prefixes, they can ignore this prefix and continue generating something fluent and reasonable. So in principle, our model uh, can ignore either the source or the prefix. So what will our model do? And uh, what we see here is that, uh, so the red line shows the source contribution for the random prefix during generation. And we see that uh, right from the beginning, the source contribution drops significantly. So the model, <clears throat> Uh, the model uh, starts to hallucinate. So even for position two, it means those, that at, at this point, we are only given uh, one random token, right? And right away, the source contribution drops down and the model starts to hallucinate. And um, yeah, so and the predictions uh, are based here severely more on the target side. And this is interesting and it shows that uh, our NMT models are really fragile, and um, it's very, very easy to make the model hallucinate. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's really easy. Um, okay, so um, to sum up this part, uh, for model generated prefixes, a model uses source more and does it more confidently, and this is because uh, model generated translations are simpler than human generated translations, and. Um, uh, when given a random prefix, the model immediately starts to hallucinate, it ignores the source. And uh, now, uh, talking, uh, continuing this um, hallucination theme and how we can avoid that, uh, let us talk a little bit about exposure bias and um, uh, what it has to do with source contributions. Um, so what, uh, what we know from previous work, Previous work uh, tried to um, compare what happens uh, when you train with a standard maximum likelihood training objective and with a minimum risk training objective, which does not suffer from exposure bias. So uh, what happens is that, um, yeah, probably I should say what, what exposure bias is. So uh, as I mentioned, during training, um, the model is conditioned on the prefix of a reference translation, right? And it's trained to predict the next token based on the prefix and the source. Um, but uh, during inference, when you're generating translation, the model, the prediction starts to be based on uh, model-generated prefixes, 
of the, on the prefixes, the model generated itself. And this is a mismatch because uh, during training, the model um, have never seen prefixes generated uh, by, by the model, right? And this mismatch between training and inference is called exposure bias. And uh, minimum risk training objective is uh, one of the objectives uh, that, which does not suffer from exposure bias. Uh, so intuitively here um, during training, we sample many translations. Uh, it's, it's nicely related to reinforcement learning, by the way. So in this setting, we um, sample many translations from the model during training, right? And uh, we give it uh, a reward or a loss, uh, which tells how close it is to their target sentence, to their reference translation. And uh, this uh, training objective does not suffer from exposure bias because during training, um, it receives its rewards or losses based on model generated translations. And the previous work empirically showed that um, with minimum risk training, uh, models suffer from hallucinations less. And they hypothesized that uh, it is exposure bias that leads to over reliance on target history and hence to hallucinations. Um, this was done at ACL 2020. Uh, and this was just a hypothesis, right? There, there was no way to evaluate this reliance on target history. Uh, but now uh, we have a method which um, allows us to explicitly evaluate this um, reliance on target. Uh, so um, I don't have much time left, uh, so I, I'll be rather brief here. So uh, what we see here is that indeed, um, when a models when models suffer from exposure bias less, our social contributions are indeed higher, and this is the case for random prefixes, uh, like in the graph I've showed you here. So, uh, the gray line is the baseline, and the red line is a minimum risk train, which does not suffer from exposure bias. So, without exposure bias, uh, source reliance is much higher. There's, so, the model tries to use the source even when given a random prefix. So even with a random prefix, the model still tries to get some information from context, you know, from the source. Okay, so uh, in the paper, we also show that this is also the case for model-generated prefixes. So overall, uh, if the model uh, suffers from exposure bias less, uh, source contribution is uh, likely to be high. And this is probably a good thing because um, in the end, we want a translation model, right? A translation has to be based on the source. Okay, uh, in the paper, we are also looking at uh, different amounts of data because as you probably know, for machine translation, the amount of training data is really important. The more data you have, the more likely you are to get a good model. Um, but <clears throat> now, uh, I'll mention some of the results uh, about the training process because this is what we'll need uh, in the next part. Uh, in the paper, we have lots of experiments and lots of results, and I will end up with the training pipeline where we explain what, what is going on at each stage. I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, I'll just um, show you one experiment uh, which we'll need in the next part. So uh, here we try to understand uh, what happens during model training. So for different steps during training, uh, we take um, a checkpoint on the step and we evaluate, for example, the total contribution of the source. And we we'll, we'll look at how this changes during training. Here on the x-axis is the training step. And here we see that uh, how the source contributions change um, during training. So first they go down and then up, then basically nothing is going on. Uh, and um, a very similar behavior is for the entropy also. Entropy first goes down, then up, then nothing is going on. Um, there can be a lot of hypotheses of what's going on here, but the main uh, thing um, you need to understand for now is that uh, the changes are not monotonic, right? And the changes are not monotonic. It means that uh, there must be some uh, qualitatively different processes uh, at, this, at these stages. Right, so if the change is not monotonic, uh, probably there are qualitatively different changes during training. And um, yeah, we can hypothesize what's going on. For example, maybe first the model learns simple things, for example, word by word translation, then uh, some something more complicated. But um, we cannot be sure without looking at translations. So so far we're just hypothesizing what's going on. 
but uh, what is really going on? And uh, we come to the final part. Uh, it, will, it will be rather brief. Um, it, uh, about uh, we'll come into our EMNOP 2021 paper. It's, uh, it's going to be presented at EMNOP this year. Um, where we look at the NMT training through the lens of classical SMT. And what I mean by, by that, once again, in traditional SMT, um, different competences were modeled by distinct model components. And the typical competences are, and, and models are a target set language model, lexical translation, um, which says which token can be translated into which token and which, with which probabilities, and uh, a reordering model, which can reorder tokens uh, inside the, the sentence. In NMT, <clears throat> Uh, in NMT, we don't have uh, such model components, right? We have a single neural network and the whole translation task is modeled with a single network. And it is not clear uh, how does NMT acquire different competences during training. For example, uh, are there any stages where it focuses more on fluency or adequacy, or is there a different behavior? Or for example, um, does it learn word by word translation first and more complicated part translator? Uh, or uh, is there some, some other kind of behavior? And this is what we'll try to understand. And uh, this is, is, again, especially interesting in light of the paper we just discussed. So there we looked at inner models, inner workings, how it forms its predictions, right? And we saw that the training is not monotonic, which means that there are stages with qualitative diff different processes. Now uh, we will look at models output, at the translations themselves. And um, we will focus on the competences related to the three core SMT components, target set language modeling, lexical translation, and reordering. And for this, we'll evaluate uh, KNLM scores, which are language modeling scores, translation quality, and monotonicity of alignments. So how monotonic the alignments are between the source and target sentence. Okay, so um, since I don't have uh, a lot of time left, let me just show you an example. So um, basically- You can with go the... a little over time if you want. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, <laughs> then, yeah, then I need five extra minutes and it's gonna be okay. Okay, so um, let's look at the language model and scores here again. Um, the x-axis um, is the training step, right? Uh, so what we see here is that uh, most of the change happens in the beginning of training. So, uh, and um, we see that the scores uh, go up and peak much higher than for the references shown in this line here. It means that uh, the model generates sentences which with very frequent engrams rather than diverse texts. And now let's look at this first early stage of training in more detail. And let's look at uh, language models with different context lengths from bigram to five gram. And interestingly, we see that there is a um, stage in training where scores for simpler models, for example, for bigram are higher than for the more complicated ones, five gram. It means that the model generates frequent uh, words and bigrams, but larger subsequences are not necessarily fluent. And now I'll, sh I'll show you an example of how it looks like. So this is um, for English German data set. The source sentence is here, uh, six months of construction works, so that's brutal. Uh, here uh, we show the translations uh, from specific training steps during this early stage of training translations to German and on the, on the right is their approximate version in English. So what we see is that indeed uh, in the beginning of training, the model first generates uh, the most frequent token, right, the SCOMA, uh, then it generates uh, the most frequent bigram, then the most frequent trigram, then the combination of uh, frequent uh, phrases, for example, uh, something about European Union and the word, right? It's a uh, very frequent uh, phrases um, in their new translation task. And only later you see something reasonable. So we can say that the early stage of machine translation training is devoted to language modeling because here we see that the model first ignores the source, right? And it's it tries to learn how to be fluent in the target language, what it means to be fluent in the target language. 
Uh, next, let's look at translation quality. Here, higher the better. Uh, so here we show the blue score, which is the standard automatic evaluation metric for machine translation, and um, token level accuracy for different frequency ranks. Uh, token level accuracy is the proportion of cases where uh, the correct uh, target token is the most probable choice. And this is what the model is trained to do. So in a classification setting, it is trained to predict next token based on the prefix and the source. So we see that uh, for rare tokens, accuracy improves slower than for the rest, which is expected because um, rare phenomena are learned later during training. But what is not clear is what happens during this uh, second half of the training, because um, changes are almost invisible, right? Even for rare tokens. So what is going on here? And luckily, we have one more thing to look at. It's uh, monotonicity of alignments. Um, so what the alignments are, you have the source sentence, the target, and you approximately, you understand which, which tokens are translated in, into each, right? So um, the alignment is there, um, the mapping between the source and the target tokens, which tells you uh, token at each source position is taken into token um, into which target position, right? Uh, when we say monotonic alignment, uh, we basically mean word by word translation when you translate each word, and this is how you get a monotonic, monotonic alignment, right? Uh, so, um, uh, for the reordering score, you can see the paper, but for now, we need to understand that um, lower scores mean less monotonic alignment, and less monotonic alignment means more complicated less monotonic, more complicated, because the simplest you can do is just do word by word translation, where you just translate each word and that's it, right? So here's the second half of the training we just saw. And um, while changes in quality were almost invisible, here we see that um, monotonicity of alignments uh, changes a lot. And um, if you think that uh, in the absolute values, this does not look like, um, something significant. A bit later, I will show you some examples and uh, I will show you how this analysis can be applied to improve uh, non-autoregressive machine translation. And you'll see that um, uh, this is uh, indeed uh, significant. And what is also interesting is that even after the model converged, so on this part, the alignments still continue to change. It means that uh, the blue score, which is the standard uh, automatic evaluation metric for machine translation is not good for the token criteria. And this is something what we saw also in one of our earlier works in context the way of machine translation, where um, we also noticed that uh, after the blue score, the model converges in terms of blue score, a discourse phenomena still continue to improve. Okay, and here are a couple of examples uh, of this uh, last stage during training. Uh, the examples are for English, German, and English, Russian, and uh, same colored um, chunks correspond to the aligned phrases. Now, I don't expect you to understand all the translations, but at least visually, um, by looking at colors, we can see that um, in the beginning of this last stage, uh, the translations are almost word by word, right? So, so they aligned perfectly to each other, right? But there's the most monotonic translation, word by word translation. And uh, uh, in the end of training, um, the translations are less monotonic, which means more complicated. For example, you can see that uh, this uh, green phrase, um, green phrase uh, at the end of sentence finally gets reordered to the beginning uh, in the Russian, right? And this uh, less monotonic translations are more natural in the target language. So for target language, this and more complicated, less monotonic translations are more natural. Uh, so uh, to summarize this part, so we saw that during training, uh, NMT undergoes the three stages. So first, it focuses on target size language modeling. And so when we saw that it, it bubble and frequent words and phrases and then starting to be reasonable. And then it uh, learns how to use source and approaches word by word translation. And this is where we get this nicely monotonic aligned translations, right? And which is basically word by word. 
And note also that this is what humans do, right? When humans learn language, children, for example, they first start bubbling some, some noises, then start bubbling some sentences, right? Then they understand what's going on. The same for translation. Uh, the simplest um, humans usually do in, when they start learning a language, they translate everything monotonically from their native language, right? So you just take uh, your native language and you translate word, word by word, right? And finally, um, this is the refinement stage where, which is visible by increasing the complex reordering when you start to um, reorder, reorder phrases and be more natural in the target language, but almost invisible to standard metrics. And if you come again, uh, come back to our previous paper, which is discussed with the contributions, you'll see that these two results agree very well. And for example, uh, in the beginning of training, uh, we see that the source contributions go down. That's when uh, a model starts to ignore the source and um, be based on the target side. And this is, this is when the model learns language modeling component, right? Then a source contribution goes, uh, uh, goes up. It's when the model starts to use source more. And uh, from their uh, next paper, we see that this is where the model learns how to translate. And uh, finally, um, yeah, and after this, these two stages, the translation is almost word by word. And uh, finally, and it's the refinement stage, which is almost invisible, even if you look at contributions, but visible by reordering. And uh, finally, um, finally, um, uh, I'm not going to go into my detail here, but uh, I just want to mention that uh, this analysis can be uh, really useful in practice. For example, um, uh, if you understand what's going on with translations, how they change during training, uh, we can apply it in practice. For example, uh, in, in settings where complexity level or regularity of the data is important. Um, all these settings and uh, translations from specific stages in training may be useful. Or um, alternatively, we know that sometimes uh, SMT inspired modeling modifications help, and uh, our analysis can help for understanding the NMT model or modeling. And in the paper, we focus on the first part and we show that um, uh, when we're dealing with a non autoregressive translation and um, uh, non autoregressive means that we are not generating tokens one by one, we're generating everything at the same time. Um, if we use, um, instead of the standard uh, distillation data, uh, which is translations from a standard autoregressive model, if we use translations from earlier stages, which are more monotonic, this can be better targets for non autoregressive translations. So now when we know that um, yeah, let me show you there this course. So now, um, uh, if, if you know that uh, earlier translations from earlier stages are more monotonic, if we use them as targets for non autoregressive translations, we, we can get more than one blue point improvements. And this is because um, this is because these translations are much more monotonic. For this, uh, if you're interested in practical applications, you can look at the paper. But uh, I'm afraid I'm out of out of time. So, um, okay, to, to conclude, uh, what we saw, um, we know that, uh, of course, end-to-end -end neural motion translation is conceptually very different from statistical approaches, because in SMT, um, humans used to uh, think about model components, about competencies, about features, right? And humans used to um, take these components and put together in the model. But in NM NMT learns everything uh, at the same time. And um, here we do not decide how it does it, right? So the model somehow gets to learn, um, gets to learn um, what is useful for translation. Uh, and uh, while these two paradigms are very different, we saw that um, NMT is actually very related to statistical models in a sense that NMT model components can learn to extract features which are put explicitly in SMT. Uh, while using the prefix and the source coexist in the same model in NMT, we can still look at how NMT uh, does this, right? How NMT balance is being fluent and adequate. And finally, NMT training consists of the stages where it focuses on competencies mirroring uh, three core SMT components, namely target style language modeling, lexical translation, and finally reordering. And this is also nicely relates to how humans learn to translate. Okay, uh, I have a blog version of this talk and 
also blog posts for the papers uh, I mentioned. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, this is really um, great talk. Uh, um, let me maybe ask uh, for some questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, there's one question on the chat board. Uh, Lina, can you uh, uh, can you uh, see the chat board? Can you open up? Um, is there any special mechanism to ignore random prefix compared to reference case? Um, and do you mean, uh, could you clarify the question? Do you mean in the model itself or can we develop uh, such a mechanism to ignore the random prefix? Can you answer? Uh, yes. Yeah, in model itself. Um, in, in the language model, right? It's uh, probably the self recovery ability I mentioned. Um, no, there's, uh, in terms of modeling, there's the standard transformer model, so nothing like it. Um, I assume that just it's coping, coping mechanism when, when dealing with unexpected stuff. <laughs> Because from the modern perspective, it's the standard model, so not, not the standard model, the standard training objective. Okay. Um, actually, I have a, a one or two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the blue score stays the same even if the monotonicity improves. Does that imply that the blue score is, is not sufficient enough? to measure the- Yes, the yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Blue score I mean, okay. is not sufficient enough. Yeah, and uh, I'm not the first one to tell you that, uh, to be honest, um, we hate blue score. Everyone hates blue score. We just don't have anything better. Is, is <laughs> there anything blue better? Is not, uh, no, no, that's the problem. You know, <laughs> we don't have anything better, but we hate it. And there's a lot of evidence that the blue score is not good. Of course, um, the best you can do is uh, human evaluation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but even in terms of automatic evaluation, there's uh, a lot of fine grained phenomena you can look at, for example, uh, monotonicity of alignments, right? Uh, discourse phenomena and so on and so forth. Maybe, maybe uh, idiomaticity of translations and so on and so forth. And the blue score alone won't, won't tell you this. Yeah. I see. Uh, in your uh, like experiment in, in your various papers, uh, is your um, model uh, mostly transformer-like models or? Uh, it depends on the paper. For example, with the training stages, we looked at different types of models. And we also look at uh, recurrent ones and um, the transformer translation model, but uh, language modeling style. It's not, not uh, usually the transformer machine translation model is encoder decoder, right? But mm -hmm. uh, you can do translation, for example, by uh, as a language modeling task by concatenating the source and the target sentences, right? And just training on concatenation of that as a left to right language model. So nice. we tried these different paradigms and different models, and we saw that uh, their ordering is the same. So all of them first learn target set language modeling, then translation, then reordering. And the only differences are the sizes of the stages. For example, um, for the STEAM model, the language modeling stage for some reason is longer. And also uh, the final, um, final level of for um, monotonicity is different. For example, if you have uh, an encoded decoder model, we end up with more natural uh, sentences than, for example, with the language modeling style MT. So with the language modeling style MT, your alignments will be uh, more monotonic, which means less, less natural, and the same for the STM model. Have you also tried the, you know, the more uh, latest models like the XLNet and then, you know, the version after that? Uh, no, not yet, not yet, but they're still transformer-based, right? Uh, actually, yeah, they're they also, still transformer-based, uh, but I heard that uh, their probabilistic modeling is slightly different. They're more like a bi-directional, in a sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and actually, I also, we also had a paper where we tried to um, generate tokens arbitrarily order, 
Like yeah, I'm sure, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, they were going to look into that, but uh, yeah, that would be interesting to see, for example, at uh, contribution patterns, there's still like a decrease in pattern or something different here. Yeah. Uh, we could do that, but uh, we haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> but this would be, yeah, this would be really, really a good uh, question to ask. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, the, the kind of problem you mentioned, uh, like including um, the hallucination uh, exists in in the, the the PowerPoint model. I mean, it's not NMT though, but it's like GPT three things like that. Well, GPT three is not a conditional English model, right? I know. So it it's, it does does not uh, have to condition on anything. So it just just hallucinates. Hallucination is when. Uh, it's a term for conditional English model when you have uh, like the source sentence or in image captioning, for example, you have an image to to condition on. Okay. Yes, it hallucinates, but it's what it's supposed to do, right? Because it's, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Uh, 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 one big, uh, a small uh, technical question. What, how do you define minimum risk in this case? Uh, uh, minimum risk, so basically you're, you're, you're sampling um, Lots of translation. You're taking uh, the probability of the whole translation according to a model, right? Ooh. You normalize it, uh, normalize and uh, smooth it over some function, and you use it as a probability uh, probability distribution. And then you just uh, evaluate how close it is uh, to the to the reference, right? So the scores are basically you're using the blue score, but uh, usually it's uh, the smooth version of blue score where you also use unigrams, y-grams and all the stuff, yeah. Okay, there's one more question from the audience. Can you read the chat form? Um, Mr. Minhu Lee. Random curiosity, I like that. Uh, it's like an ongoing research where given a sentence of some language, a model generates an entirely a new language. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you mean do you mean a translation task? Well, translation does this. It takes a sentence in one language and generates yeah. another language. But uh, what, what do you mean by even that? a translation model? Right? Yeah. So so, so translate every translation model takes sentence in one language and generates uh, an entirely new language. Ah, entirely new. Do you mean zero, zero shot? Mm, yes, in multilingual settings, some uh, regenerative model. But what is the uh, uh, like uh, practical usage of that kind of generative model, uh, Mr. Lindley? Maybe there are multilingual models that uh, can behave like this, and I know some multilingual models uh, can do zero shot, for example. Um, when during training you didn't have an exactly so you have or you had the source language with some target languages you had the target language with and other sources right but you didn't have the the same the exactly this translation pair uh, uh -huh. sometimes it can work this way but uh, generally i don't know what do you mean in terms of contributions what happens can we detect that I mean, it can be useful for multilingual MT also, and it would be interesting to see uh, how the contributions are different. So if you have a multilingual model, um, how different the contributions for different language players within the same model? This would be really interesting, right? Um, and for example, what happens in zero, zero shot? Oh, that's rather, uh, yeah, I'm gonna read it out loud. So I thought that we could maybe observe a generative model that creates an unseen language and, gain insights about how humans develop language in general. Um, I haven't seen anything like it, but that's a very interesting direction to go. Maybe he's majoring in uh, linguistics, I guess, the audience. Maybe, maybe. But that's, that's really Is it true, uh, Mr. Minouli, or not? <laughs> uh, are there any questions before we close up? It's getting late and... Uh, uh, people here may get hungry, I guess, since uh, 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 six o'clock. Any other questions before we close up? Okay. If not, uh, let me. Uh, okay. okay. 
Uh, let me uh, uh, thank uh, Ms. Lina Oita uh, for your excellent talk. Uh, uh, we will give you a big round of applause, although it may not be seen. Thanks a lot, and I hope uh, we you. can meet uh, in the future, maybe uh, uh, deep learning or AI related uh, meetings. Okay, let's get. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.